On February 8, 2001, in a downtown area of Chengdu, China, construction workers stumble upon a remarkable archaeological discovery. Experts dub it one of the most important discoveries of this century. These are the spoils found at the excavation site known as Jingsha. Archaeologists find a treasure trove of more than mere jade and gold. They uncover several burial grounds with thousands of human remains, all facing southeast. You found remains, human remains, of young men with their hands bound behind their back. Was this a sign of human sacrifice? Who were these people discovered at the Jingsha ruins? How powerful was their king? And why did their civilization disappear? This is a huge site. I am Dr. Agnes Xu, archaeologist in the Director China Institute. You guys have to capture this. This is ivory coming up. I'm on a quest to solve the mystery of the lost city of Tingsha. The Yellow River. Many consider it the backbone of Chinese civilization. This was China at the time of unification in 221 BCE, ruled by the first emperor of Qing. A thousand years before that, a dynasty of kings known as the Shang ruled the central plain of the Yellow River. For so long, the central plain is thought to be the only birthplace of Chinese culture. Not anymore. The discovery at Jingsha is forcing historians and archaeologists to rethink this. An independent culture thrived around the same time as the Shang Dynasty. This was a kingdom locked between mountains and valleys in an area known as the Sichuan Basin. My quest as an archaeologist is to dig deeper into who these mysterious people were and what their society was like. Very little is known about this kingdom. The people who inhabited ancient Chengdu left no written records. Our only knowledge about them come from texts of other rival cultures. And they were called the Shu people. Chengdu is a modern city that's going through rapid economic changes. Over 200 of the Fortune 500 companies are based here. This is an old, old city that its ancient seat is, is in Jingsha. I'm on my way to Jingsha, about three miles from the city center. My quest is to unravel the mystery of this lost kingdom and its forgotten people. I want to find out how the civilization flourished and how it was suddenly wiped out from history. What did these ancient people believe in? Did they die in a ritual of human sacrifice? Their bloody secrets buried for thousands of years? The man leading this from day one is archaeologist Zhu Zhangyi. He's dedicated most of his life to uncovering the mysteries of Jingsha. This is just all inspiring as an archaeologist to be here. Tell us about the discovery of Jingsha. Jingsha is actually a surprise discovery. When we were building the road, we found a lot of rock debris. It was found in 2001, on February 8th. The local village authorities sent the police to the police department. The police then sent us a message. We were on February 8th at 
回到成都。那么二月九号的早上一早的话，来到那个现场，哎，当时非常非常的惊讶，哎，很多很多的光幕就在地下。看到这种文物的话，我们激动得不得了。那是以考古学家一生所追求的、梦寐以求的东西，我们终于发现。是是是。Drew and his team find thousands of artifacts of significant value: jade daggers and ornaments, gigantic elephant tusks, gold objects. He believes this is no ordinary site of the ancient Shu people. Drew thinks. This may be their sacrificial grounds. I did not realize that Jingshan site is so big. Can you show us the development of this archaeological site, where we are and where we're going? This picture is basically the whole of the Jingshan site. We are now in this museum. This museum is the whole museum. Actually, the whole Jingshan site, we are now in the context of our cultural development. 它主要分成三块，这是最核心的一块，并且出土的文物也是最多的，发掘面积也是最大的。The Jingsha site consists of more than ten areas. They include the palace site and several burial areas. I'm overwhelmed with what I'm seeing here, but my preliminary investigation only leads to more questions. So, Dr. Zhu, was there human sacrifice here? 在金沙遗址，我们发现了两千多种墓葬。实际上，这种墓葬都是小型的一种墓葬。那么，在目前来讲，没有发现人群的一种情况。但是，我们也不敢就这样就推断，它古代蜀人就一定没有人群。为什么讲？因为我们可能要等待大型墓葬或者王陵的发现，看是不是它还有那个地方有没有人群。It's an intriguing question that requires me to look for more clues. Having come across such a huge mystery. It reminds me of my childhood, when I would spend hours in the dirt looking for something, pretending to be a detective. Being an archaeologist is like being a detective, in search of historical puzzles and answers to these puzzles. That has always been a motivating factor for me. I was an odd bird growing up in Taiwan. Unlike other girls, I was a tomboy who enjoyed playing the dirt, <laughs> and I liked digging things up. I wanted to be an archaeologist even before I knew the term archaeology. When I first saw Indiana Jones, I wanted to be Indiana Jones. Unlocking history's mysteries is still a thrill for me, and the Jingsha mystery is the biggest thrill of all. And this thrill couldn't get any bigger when a critical clue is found. March 5th, 2001, a month after archaeologists begin excavating at Jingsha, a discovery that shocks the world: a small stone statue about 17 centimeters tall. I'm looking at an ancient face of despair. Look at the exaggerated lack of eyes. Look at the flattened mouth and his hands bound behind his back. He's kneeling in a position ready to face his tragic fate. If there was a face of human sacrifice in the ancient world, this would have been it. Twelve of such statues had been discovered at Jingsha. Archaeologists found these statues aligned in a certain formation, together with stone tigers and bronze discs. What was the message that the ancient Shu people left behind? To get a clear sense of what the statue meant to the Shu people, I meet with Wang Feng, an archaeologist who has spent decades studying Shu artifacts. So, Professor Wang, let's talk about the statue. Why is it so important to the Shu people? We can see this statue is very special. 
，他的那个腿是双腿是跪地的，嗯，然后他的双手是反绑的后面，后面还有清楚的有一个绳索的一个胶带，对，然后他的发饰也很特殊，嗯，我们可以看到他后面有两股变法。但是你看他前面的那个发型啊，是中分的，向两边四角是翘起来的， right. 就像一本我们形容它就像一本翻开的书。Oh. <笑><笑>那么这种人像呢，实际上它也是代表了一种一定的特殊的宗教的含义。他跪坐的双手， mm-hmm. 他屈跪的双那个肢体。那么它实际上是体现了一种比较低级的一种位地位，哎、呃，这是一种说法。但是另外也有学者提出一种新的思路，就是说他这样的石贵州人呢，也可能是当时的巫师。这个、这上海有一那么在这个干旱的季节，那么为了祈求上天护佑森林。啊，那把自己的双手绑起来，把头发剪掉，然后去求雨的一种现象的这样的一种表现。The the kneeling statues may hint of the practice of human sacrifice, but to get to the bottom of it, I need to look at a very important clue: human remains. And here at Jingsha. There are plenty. I'm in the downtown area of Chengdu called Jingsha. This is the site of an ancient kingdom named Shu, more than 3,000 years ago. I'm on a quest to find out if the ancient Shu people indeed practiced human sacrifice. One clue is to look up north, on the central plains of present-day Anyang. This was the ancient Shang capital. Here, the practice of human sacrifice has been well documented. Professor Li is with the Archaeological Institute of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. He has helped to excavate on important relics from the Shang era. This is a Shang Dynasty chariot excavated at Anyang. The chariot is found buried in a tomb, complete with its horses. And. Someone else. This is the Peizang Kong, isn't it? This is Peizang Chariot Kong, not the Kong that is specially Peizang people. The Kong of the Kong does not have Peizang this car. It is specially to dig up a Peizang Chariot Kong, to put its car in the past and used it as a Peizang Chariot. Yes. Who is this person? This person, we think, is the owner of the Peizang Chariot Kong. Why did he choose? 陪葬呢？在这个夏商周吧，属于商代晚期的这个殷墟这个阶段，因为还属于奴隶奴隶社会。当这个他这个就是穆族人下葬的时候，呃，他这个家里边的好多他雇佣的奴隶啊，或者佣人呐、啊，可能什么等等吧，他的下人，在他死去的时候要进行要对他进行陪葬。It's clear the Shang culture practiced human sacrifice. But what about the Shu people? Experts believe there were strong cultural links between the Shang and Shu peoples. The two were in constant contact. If that's the case, could the Shu people also have used humans to appease their gods? My next clues are these 3,000-year-old human remains found in one of the burial sites. What are we looking at? What's so special about this particular skull that we're seeing here? He Kuanyu is a forensic anthropologist who studies bone fragments in order to understand more about the ancient Shu people. So I understand you've done research also at the burial sites um, at Jingsha. Can you tell us a little bit of the, your analysis based on the research of the human remains there? We found a very special thing. There are two things. 很很有意思，在几个墓地里面都出现这个情况，就是男性的死亡年龄集中在这个二十五到三十岁。然后他我们就是包括联系他这个随葬品，有些兵器啊，就之类的，我们就就是推断他大概可能跟当时是不是有这个战争有关系。
另外一个墓地里面，我们发现有这个俯身葬的，就是这样子趴在上后面的，然后手是在后面的。我们就是怀疑他那种可能是作为一种葬服或者作为一种祭祀的。And they looked as if like those statues that we found on the site of Jingsha. Are these people the same as the people that were depicted in the statues? In the last few years, Chinese archaeologists had uncovered several burial sites containing more than 2,000 human remains. None of them, though, were royal graves. But still, I am convinced that these graves will reveal important clues about the Shu people, and if they indeed practiced a form of human sacrifice. To get to the bottom of this, I need to walk among the dead. And one of the first things that catches my eye, the ornate objects buried alongside the dead. It's 比较位的墓葬稍微要，就是等级上要高一些，应该是代表当时这个上层的一个阶层或者是个贵族的一一一种的墓葬的形形式。Among the nobles of the Shu people, it's common for them to bury their dead with highly prized objects. But could that also include human capital? As an archaeologist, I've been trained to look for specific details at sites like these. Every single bone fragment counts. In one of the graves nearby, I see something that doesn't look quite right. Oh my goodness, that looks like there's another another person right there. There's another skeleton. 对，我们可以看到，在他的这个右右手的话，他是这样做的这么一个这个形状的。在他的右手下面，我们还可以看到，呃，经过我们鉴定，他还是人骨，还是这个属于我们这人的这个小腿骨，就是胫骨。So that's a leg bone So the person that was actually sacrificed was already dismembered before it was buried underneath this man of high status. This skeleton is obviously someone of great importance. And when he was buried, we can see that underneath him, to his right, there is evidence of human remains, of another human being. As archaeologists, we are open-minded, and we have to explore other possibilities. We know for a fact that this practice had been practiced long before the Jingsha culture. This is a connection to the Shang Dynasty in the Central Plain region. But I think I'm right. I think we just discovered something unique. To the ancient Shu people, sacrifice, object or otherwise, was clearly important. But to whom were they sacrificing? One major clue, the discovery of an artifact that stuns archaeologists. <laughs> I'm in Chengdu to investigate the lost city of Jingsha, part of an ancient culture called Shu. The city was only discovered in 2001. For the Shu people, sacrifice, precious objects or otherwise, was an important part of their culture. But who or what were these sacrifices for? A piece of the puzzle lies here. A thin gold foil, no larger than 12 and half centimeters in diameter, and only 0.2 millimeters thick. 
when it was first uncovered at the excavation site, it was found crumbled into a ball. It took several years of painstaking effort by archaeologists to restore it to its current state. Wang Yi looks after Chengdu's historical relics. He has been heading the archaeology teams at all of Sichuan's ancient heritage sites. Based on his research, he thinks the Shu people were culturally highly sophisticated. Tifu在是一个什么样的东西,现在我们还在进行研究,但是我们可以想象在这个区域,古代属人心目当中是特别崇拜太阳,崇拜太阳神。所以有属权废日的这么一种说法,那么在他心目当中,他是向往光明的。This fascination with the sun is perhaps not surprising. This is Chengdu on a regular day, overcast and foggy. For the ancient Shu people who heavily depended on bountiful harvest, the sun equates to life itself. Without it, starvation and death could become a reality. Now it makes sense to me. The sacrifices found at Jingsha may be a way for them to appease the sun god. But did the ancient Shu people only worship the sun? Wang tells me he doesn't think so. He thinks their faith system was more complex than that. Less than 50 meters from the sacrificial zone, there is another clue that suggests this was a highly sacred site. The root of an ancient banyan tree. Archaeologist Zhu Zhang Yi tells me this is no ordinary tree. Why is this tree so special compared to other trees? This tree was in the ancient forest. It was in the river. This tree, in the past, it was about 1 meter or 2 meter. It was about 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 2 meter. Based on other excavation results um, from later period, we think what they did with this particular tree was that they would decorate it with bronze bells. So when the wind blows, the bells would shake and therefore creating this harmonious music that would be the music of heaven. This tree represented the, a connection. This was their connector between the people of Shu and um, heaven in their gods. Today, only remnants of the tree's roots are left. But I'm curious to know if this holy tree was also where sacrifices were made. To find the answer, I need to travel 38 kilometers from Jingsha to Sanxingdui.
I will examine a clue discovered at an archaeological site that predated Jingsha by hundreds of years. This is where ancestors of the Shu people once lived. Discovered in the late 1980s, it was the seat of power of the Shu kingdom around 1500 BCE. Like Jingsha, the excavation site has been turned into a museum. And I'm told one particular artifact holds the key to understanding the faith of the Shu people. A four-meter bronze sculpture dubbed the Divine Tree of Sanxingdui. Buried for thousands of years, it was an object of sacrifice. Professor, this is absolutely breathtaking. Most of us haven't seen anything like this before. Tell us, what exactly is this? This tree can be said is the largest tree in the world in 3,000 years ago. And it is the most complicated tree in the world. Yes. It is a tree that is connected to the sky, the sky, the sky, and the sky. It is possible that it is in the whole of the tree of the tree. What is the connection with the tree we found at Jingsha? These trees and the tree of the sky are connected. 这个青铜神树是照这样的树做一个树崇拜的一个标志物，因为当时的人们很相信树是生命的起源，又是生长的起源，又是通天的一条路，又是各种神奇的果实的生长地，也是神灵所居住的地方，又是天地人交往的一个中心，所以他把很多美好的信仰都集中在树。Professor Zhao believes. That the ancient Shu people would hang sacred objects on trees to express their faith. One such object is astounding not only for its sheer size, but also for its bizarre look. A gigantic bronze mask with large ears and protruding eyes. These are the famous Sanxingdui bronze giant masks. Considering how big and magnificent the sculpture is, it must have been really important to the Shu people. What was it used for? This one, we call it the Big Mask. It is a mask made of a mask. Actually, it is a god. In the Shu people, such a god has been brought to the Shu people. Some of them are similar to the real size. Some of them are bigger than the real size. It is not a human body. 头上能带着活动的，可能是戴在一个大的树或者大的建筑上。At the Sanxingdui site, three of these giant masks have been unearthed. Like the other valuable artifacts found at Jingsha, these masks were also likely to be sacrificial items. These masks were clearly very important to the Shu people, but making them could not have been easy. One way to find out is by observing how these bronze masks are replicated today. The ancient Shu people clearly show a strong devotion to their gods. They worship the sun, the earth, and the trees. But one thing still confounds me. Who does the bronze mask represent? The Sanxingdui mask with the protruding eyes and the open ears. In Chinese, we call it Qianli uh, Yan, the eyes that can see thousands of miles. The ears we call Zhao um, Feng Er, the ears that flutter in the wind. These are auspicious facial features to describe a person. Could he be the king to whom the sacrifices were made? Or is he a shaman? Or is he God himself? The answer may lie with this small ornate figurine found at the Jingsha site.
The statue may only be 15 centimeters tall. His large almond-shaped eyes are wide open. At the back, he wears a long three-stranded plate and on his head, a round swirling hat. Archaeologists think he's an important figure in the ancient Shu society. Could he be the king of the Shu people? The one who led his people to sacrifice precious objects? For archaeologists, getting all the answers from a tiny relic isn't easy. I'm getting the help of modern technology to get a closer look at this rare artifact. Modern technology is really amazing. Yes. What can this technology tell us that archaeologists cannot see? Some relics are, are broken, so it needs to repair. So after we scan, you got the result. You can find out which part is uh, loosened. This bronze figure appears to be holding something that's missing. What could he be holding? And more importantly, who was he? The accidental archaeological discovery at Jingsha has revealed an ancient Chinese kingdom that's little known to the world. A key clue unearthed, a tiny bronze statue. Experts believe he was an important figure. Was he a divine leader to whom the sacrifices at Jingsha were made? My questions lead me back to Sanxingdui, where I'm told there's a similar statue. Only this time, size does matter. To investigate further, I arranged to meet with Professor Zhao once more. In 1986, he was one of the archaeologists who helped to excavate the similar but much larger bronze statue. Who is he in the Shu culture? We currently see Sichuan, Nairo, Quan Guo, even in the world, three thousand years ago, the biggest Qing temple. And his armor is very strong. He is standing at a very high position, so his appearance is very unique. We think he is a person, a god, 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 a god. 就是指挥着整个的巫师的活动，所以他是在整个三星队的祭祀活动中间最有最高的地位。What is he holding in his hands? 有几种说法，有的认为是拿着鬃，有的认为拿着是祭祀的杖，也很可能拿的是象牙。Because this is the same as the top of the top, and the top of the top is the same as the top of the top. The top of the top is the top of the top. The large bronze statue in Sanxingdui and the smaller ones in Jingsha are likely to hold the same status. Based on the clues we have so far, I know he's likely to be someone with divine powers. A shaman with a direct connection to the heavens. But could he also be the king and ruler of the Shu people? The Shu left behind no written records. What little we know about them comes from an ancient manuscript, the Huayang Guozhi, written a thousand years after the Shu's demise. The first king of the Shu people was named Cán Cong, and it is recorded in this ancient text that he had protruding eyes feature that was unique to the gods. Everything now clicks. The two separate paths of worship and kingship converge at this crucial clue. The Shu ruler was not only a king, he was also God. As king and god, the Shu ruler held great influence over his subjects. Did this translate into immense wealth for him and his people? Could this then be the reason why so many valuable objects were sacrificed at Jingsha? 
Historically, the Sichuan Basin has always been one of the richest areas in all of China. It produced large quantities of copper, silver, cinnabar, and as you can see, all kinds of precious stones. No wonder we call this paradise on earth. Rich natural resources mark the affluence of the Sichuan Basin, not to mention the most precious of all metals, gold. Not surprisingly, in 2007, archaeologists at Jingsha also struck gold, literally. Gold. <laughs> And most remarkably, a mysterious object emerged from the ground. a gold mask. Masks are an age-old cultural phenomenon shared by all ethnic groups of China. Masks were given the functions of communicating with gods, bringing blessings, driving away ghosts, and warding off diseases. But a gold mask can be afforded only by the rich and the powerful. Could this be a spiritual object used by the divine king? Did he wear it to conduct sacrificial rituals? So what's the significance of this mask? Was it used by the Shu king as part of the worship? So when he puts on the golden mask, the king becomes God. Mind blowing. Thirsty to know the extent of power the Shu God King had over his subjects, I head to a site where a vital clue has been unearthed his palace. The vast area of the palace indicates a wealthy king who requires a massive amount of space to store great possessions. But what fascinates me the most is the numerous peripheral houses. Around the palace zone was a large number of smaller houses each no more than 20 square meters in area. Archaeologists have speculated that these were the houses of those people who served the people living inside the palace zone. 
It's now clear to me the Shu Kingdom was not only wealthy, but also elite and hierarchical. But there's another piece of the puzzle that may just reveal how wealthy and powerful this kingdom was. For Jingsha was where archaeologists made another unprecedented discovery. You guys have to capture this. This is the this is ivory coming up. Jingsha's discovery in 2001 rocked the archaeological world. It changed the way historians view the history of ancient China. I'm about to witness a dramatic revelation at this site. The world's largest cache of ivory. What she's doing here is to apply a special concoction they invented here because they have to perform this type of triage to these ancient tusks. We know that one of the chemicals used is protein. It's a concoction to stabilize these elephant tusks as they are uncovered. Buried for over 3,000 years, these ivory are extremely brittle and have to be protected with extreme care. The longest ivory piece measures 1.85 meters. But why so much ivory? Was this the ultimate sacrifice for the gods? My questions lead me back to Professor Wang. She holds a jade blade with a strange carving. This is one of the most interesting pieces I've seen with this pattern uh, on the jade. What is it? It's a man in profile wearing a short skirt and he, and he wears a mask over his face and we can see that he's carrying an elephant tusk over his shoulder. We believe this is a pictorial representation of a ritual that involves a shaman carrying these elephant tusks. This is how we can explain this large quantity of, of elephant tusks that, we, tusks that we found at the site. All these pieces of the puzzle finally seem to come together. The unparalleled treasure troves of ivory, jade, and gold reveal how Jingsha was a land of great power and prosperity. They were a deeply spiritual people who held on strongly to their faith. But there's one final question. How did their civilization disappear? <laughs> Till today, Archaeologists and historians are baffled by the demise of a city of such stature. One theory, earthquakes destroy the city and its people. In 2008, an earthquake hit Sichuan. It was one of the most devastating natural disasters in China's recent history. Over 80,000 people killed. Many more lost their homes. These are the reminders nature's wrath. If an earthquake of such magnitude had also hit Jingsha 3,000 years ago, it would have wiped out an entire people. But not all experts agree. Retired historian and archaeologist Lin Xiang has spent a better part of his life researching on the Shu people. Professor Lin, we know this area is historically known for major earthquakes. Do you think it's possible that earthquake was one of the reasons, or a major reason, that led to the demise of the Shu people. 
这个地震考古的调查，发现古建筑的破坏程度都低于七度或者七度左右吧，这么一个情况。因此呢，金沙受地震直接的影响不大。There's another theory that Professor Lin feels could explain the kingdom's downfall. The answer he thinks lies here, 35 miles away from Jingsha. This is Minjiang. It's a water of the Kingdom of Jingsha. But this water, often because the water of the water is too big, will explode. Sometimes, 水少了要干旱，所以这个地方呢，一直呢就成了一个治水的重要的地方。This great body of water was both the reason to the rise of the Shu people, but also their demise. When this great flood happened, Sanxingdui, which was a flourishing capital at the time, was completely annihilated as a result of this, this deluge. This was what could have happened 3,000 years ago. Today, the ground is dry largely because of the Dujiangyan irrigation system that was built in the 3rd century BCE. It is the only ancient irrigation system in China that's still in use. It diverts the waters and dramatically reduces the threat of floods, turning Chengdu into a land of abundance and great prosperity. But during the ancient Shu period, these rising waters would have easily destroyed their kingdom. Did they make sacrifices to the water to pacify it as a as a form of a deity? We saw that this is a lot of expectation and expectation. It's mainly a ceremony of the water. Really? Because that place was originally a Gu River. This river, when the water is dry, is easy to destroy the whole area. So it's important to have a ceremony on the river. The ceremony is to ask the water to not be destroyed, to not be destroyed, to not be destroyed. Now it all makes sense to me. The practice of sacrifice was likely a desperate solution for the Shu people and their god king facing the wrath of the water gods. And when rising waters finally engulfed their city, they had no choice but to relocate. Until today, archaeologists do not know where the Shu people migrated to after they left Jingsha. The hunt is still on in many parts of Chengdu for potential excavation sites. I see workers in the field. This is what field excavation really looks like. This is a huge site. The moderns living with an ancient. As you can see around us, real estate is developing really quickly at Chengdu. This is one of the few areas left in the city of Chengdu that they can carry out this large-scale excavation. For thousands of years, the Shu people have remained buried in silence, with barely any evidence of their existence. On my journey, I've discovered a powerful, wealthy, and deeply religious civilization. I have no doubt that more secrets will be uncovered at Jingsha. But until then, these remain the mysteries of China.